I'm not going to move. I'll just preach on this right here. Is that okay? I'll just stand right here. I promise I will. You believe me? All right, I want you to. I'll tell you what I want to do. I want to go to the book of Acts for a moment. And uh, we'll spend just a few moments here. And we will start in Acts chapter number 3. Acts chapter number 3. And I'll talk to you for a moment, preach to you for a few moments. Let me say thank you again for all of your kindness. Thank you for uh, not, uh, uh, how, all the things folks have done. Folks have brought me by some eggs. My, uh, my pastor has chickens, and so when I'm home, I get to eat eggs that have actually seen a chicken. <laughs> Amen. When you go, you go stay in the hotel, and I eat some of them eggs, and I'm, I'm suspicious that they never have seen a chicken. And then they have bacon that I don't think has ever seen a hog. But, uh, but I appreciate those eggs folks have brought me, and some folks got me some, uh, some bacon. I've been eating eggs and bacon every morning, or else eggs and sausage, one of the two been doing that for a while and the doctor said I had high cholesterol so just despite him I've been eating eggs every morning amen I'm just kidding about that but uh, but and then uh, the preacher's been taking me out we've been having a good time of fellowship brother Jonathan came with us today we enjoyed fellowshipping with him and I appreciate how you take care of me I've been coming here a long time and I always look forward to being here at the Rome Baptist Temple and uh, I'll say this there's a good spirit here uh, it's a it's a spirit just I, I don't know how to describe it but it's just good it's pleasant and it's encouraging and I thank the Lord uh, for what he's doing here you know I loved brother Goolsby and he was my hero but I love brother Hanks too and I'm thankful for him I'm thankful for how the Lord's using him here in this in this place I appreciate the goodness of the Lord well Acts chapter number three I have to read a little bit of scripture here and uh, we'll read a little bit in chapter 3, and then I want to read a verse in chapter 4, and I'll just preach to you for just a few moments. Acts chapter number 3 in verse 1. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, <clears throat> excuse me, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. And as the same, and as the lame man which was healed held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them in the porch that is called Solomon's greatly wondering. And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us, as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk? The God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered up, and denied him in the presence of Pilate, when he was determined to let him go. But ye denied the Holy One and the just, and desired a murderer to be granted unto you, and killed the prince of life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong, whom ye see, and know ye, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, I wot that through ignorance you did it, as did also our rulers. But those things which God hath before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets, that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. Repent ye, therefore, and be converted, 
that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heavens must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after as many have spoken have likewise foretold of these days. Ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, And in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Unto you first, God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. And as they spake unto the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in hold unto the next day, for it was now eventide. Now, if you have your Bible, look in verse 13 of chapter 4. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And beholding the man which was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves saying, watch this now, what shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest and to all them that dwell in Jerusalem and we cannot deny it. Now I'm going to pray and when I'm done praying, I want to preach for a few moments on a notable miracle. A notable miracle. Now Father, we love you tonight because you first loved us. We're thankful for your grace and your mercy. We're glad to be assembled together with the saints of God. We're thankful for the songs of Zion, for the fellowship of believers. We thank you tonight for the word of God and the sweet Holy Spirit. We thank you for the Lord Jesus who died on the cross for our sin. We thank you for that shed blood. We thank you, Lord, for the new birth. We thank you, Lord, that we can walk after the Spirit and walk in holiness and walk with you. We're glad that you're our God and we're glad to be your children. Children. And I pray you'll help us now in the next few moments to preach the Word of God in the power of the Holy Ghost. And I pray, Lord, that you'll be glorified. And I know that if you're glorified, then we'll get help. Lord, we've already had preaching tonight in these wonderful testimonies and the songs that have been sung. But Lord, if you'll help me for just a few moments, let me preach about how wonderful you are and how good it is to be saved and how you can change the lives of men and women and boys and girls. And we'll thank you and we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Now, when we come to Acts chapter 4, we got some folks that are angry. They're mad. And I'll tell you why they're mad. They're mad because they're losing their grip on the people. They're mad because they have had, they have been the rulers of the Jews, the Pharisees, the scribes, and this crowd, the Sadducees, and they have sort of had their way. And now they've got, uh, they've got some folks that are preaching another way, and it's the way of the Lord Jesus. It's the gospel. And they're not happy about it, and they're religious, and they're steeped in their religion, but somehow their religion has blinded them to the truth of the Word of God. If anybody should have met, if anybody should have recognized the Messiah, it should have been the Pharisees, it should have been the scribes, it should have been the priests that know the Word of God, but their religion has blinded them to the truth of the Word of God. So now they're mad. They don't want these fellows preaching in the name of Jesus. I'll just say this to you, it's not part of the message, but just as a word of warning, and you know it's true, you go, you could talk about God, you could talk about faith, you can even sometimes talk about the Bible, folk won't get mad at you, but you go talking about Jesus, somebody going to get sideways somewhere, somebody going to get upset, and so, and, and it's the reason is because whenever you bring up Jesus, it demands a response. You're going to have to respond to the Lord Jesus Christ. So they're mad about it, so they, they want to stop the disciples from doing what they're doing, but they have this problem, and here is their problem. The problem is there is a notable miracle 
that has taken place. There is something that is so notable when you think about notable. I think I looked it up. I think the word notable is found five times in our Bible. One time it is in reference to uh, the Antichrist, that notable horn. And uh, it has to do with something that is, it, it's just so obvious and it is so out of the ordinary. It is so above the usual that it cannot be denied and it cannot be explained away. And so they say, we have seen a notable miracle. And not only have we seen it, but the people have seen it. You say, preacher, well, what was that notable miracle? That notable miracle was a man who was lame. Now think about it. He's lame from his mother's womb. He has never taken a step in his entire life. Not one time as he stood up on his own two feet. Not one time as he walked down to the temple. But every time, and I don't know how often they did it, but apparently, uh, maybe daily, I don't know, someone would carry him and lay him down at the door of the temple. So the people would go down, and they'd go to the temple to worship, they'd go to the temple to pray, and here he'd be, laying beside the door. They know he's crip uh, crippled, they know he's lame from his mother's womb, they know he's never taken a step, they know all about him, and then one day, they come, and here's that man who never has taken a step, never has stood on his own two feet, never has had any power in his legs, all of a sudden he's leaping, and he's jumping around, and he's walking around, and he's praising God. It is a notable miracle. Now let me, let me this, let, let's just think about the symbolism of it, the type of it, the picture of it. That's what happened to you and I. We had no strength. We did not have the strength to serve God and to be what God wanted us to be. Our sister gave her testimony. Sister Marilyn gave us her testimony about being good, trying to be good, living good. We All of us, we tried, but none of us were able to do it because there's none good, Jesus said. But God, Paul said, I know that in my flesh, that, that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. Paul said in Romans, there is none good, there is none righteous, there's none that understandeth, there's none that seeketh after after God. None of us are good. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone uh, to our own way. The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. We are all sinners. There is none good. Not one. Not a good person anywhere. Not anywhere. All sinners from the top of our head to the bottom of our feet. And because of that, we couldn't walk the way we were supposed to walk. We couldn't live the way we were supposed to live. We couldn't do the things we were supposed to do. But you know what happened? One day in the name of Jesus, we got healed. We got spirit spiritually healed. We got new life in us. The Holy Ghost took up residence and we became the temple of the living God. And that Holy Ghost that's in us gives us the power to live the way we're supposed to live. The Bible said, uh, uh, Paul said, what know you not? Your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God. You're not your own. You're bought with a price. Wherefore glorify God in your body and your spirit which are God's. We could not glorify God in our body. We could not glorify God in our spirit until we got born again. Now that we're born again, the Holy Ghost lives in us and we can bring glory to God. And so in effect, we are doing what happened here in this verse. We are leaping and praising God and telling the world Jesus did something for us. We're not what we used to be. Amen. We're sinners saved by grace now. We're the children of the living God. We are the dwelling place of God. You know what's happened in your life, and you know other people that it's happened in their life, that the gospel has changed their life, that what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary has changed their life. They used to live one way, now they're living a different way. One day I was preaching out in Butler, Pennsylvania, and uh, preaching at the Mount Zion Baptist Church, and after the service I stand in the foyer and I shake at hands, and this this older, he was older than I was. He came up to me and he shook my hand. He didn't say, good preaching preacher. He didn't say, glad you was here today. He didn't say, we had a fine service. He just looked me in the eye and he said, 30 years, preacher. I thought, 30 years. I thought maybe he's talking about the sermon being too long. I don't know. He said, 30 years. And I said, 30 years. He said, 30 years since these lips have tasted a drop of liquor. He said, I was a drunkard and I got born again. And it's been 30 years since these lips have tasted a drop of liquor. I was preaching an ambassador. You know what that is? That's a notable miracle right there. I was preaching in Ambassador Baptist Church, Hudson, North Carolina. I was preaching one night and in the invitation, here come a man and he didn't get down on the altar. He come and wrapped his arms around. There was no 
communion table, he wrapped his arms around the pulpit. I don't know why he did that, but he wrapped his arms around the pulpit and started crying out to God and asking God to save him from sin. He got born again there with his arms wrapped around the pulpit. And after the service, his wife came up. A lady came up. I didn't know it was his wife. She came up. She said, Preacher, she said, that was my husband that got saved tonight. Uh, that man that came up wrapped his arm around the pulpit and cried out to God, that's my husband. And I said, well, I'm so glad he got saved. She said, I am too. She said, he's a heroin addict and been an addict a long time. He got born again. You say, well, preacher, what happened to him? Well, I saw him several years later. I was in a different place. He had moved and he came to the service. I was in Dub uh, let's see, Dublin, uh, Dublin, Georgia is where I was at Northside Baptist Church. And he came in and he walked up. His name is Rufus. He came up. He walked up and he shook my hand. He said, you knew who I am? I said, you're Rufus. He said, I am. I said, you got saved at the, at the, at the Ambassador Baptist Church in Hudson, North Carolina. He said, I sure did. I said, how you doing? He said, I'm a deacon at the church up the road living for God. You know what that is? That's a notable miracle. A notable miracle. My pastor's wife, she's raised up in a, in a tavern. And her mom and daddy ran a tavern. That's where she was raised up. That's how she lived in the tavern. And sometimes she'd make a little extra money as a child getting up and sing some old worldly song in the tavern for those men in the tavern when she was a girl. And uh, But my preacher, he started visiting her. He was going to Indiana Baptist College and a member of the Spiceland, or I can't remember the name of the church. I think it was Spiceland Baptist Church. And he started visiting her. He met her one day when he's out knocking on doors. He's a young Bible student at the college. He started knocking on doors and he came and he met this this girl Mary Brown and he invited her to come to church and so she came to church and uh, she didn't she wasn't too interested at first but she came two or three times you know what happened she heard the gospel and she got born again and been a preacher's wife until she went home to be with the Lord last year she's a preacher's wife for 50 uh, 54 years and and he's pastored the church our church 50 years and you say preacher what happened to that girl a notable miracle happened to that girl same thing happened to you when you got saved. The Bible said, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. The preacher already said it tonight. Your testimony, your testimony before your lost family, your testimony will make a difference. A notable miracle has taken place. So I'm thinking about this notable miracle, and I thought to myself, I would like to see a lot of notable miracles. I'd like to see a lot of people who were walking one way and now they're walking one another way. Who used to walk after the flesh and now are walking after the spirit. Who used to walk like the Gentiles in the vanity of their mind. And now they know the word of God and are living for God. I'd like to see some notable miracles, wouldn't you? I remember one time, I'm going to preach here in a minute, but I remember one time we were in Georgia. We were up near Locust. We were in Locust Grove and they, they we used to, I used to preach every year. Uh, I preached for Brother Terrell Hopkins, and at that time he was at Riverdale Baptist Church, or I, I think it was Second Riverdale or First Riverdale Baptist Church, something like that. And they sold the building and built a new building in Locust Grove. And so in between selling the old building and buy, buy, building the new building, we had to meet in a, in a hall there. There was, a, there was an auction hall in Locust Grove. And so we rented that, and we would come in, and they'd come in, and they'd pull the bleachers out in the auction hall, and they'd put down carpet, they'd set up the PA, and so we came to have revival there, have revival in the meeting. And one night, I'm going to tell you, one night God moved in, and that thing just, it just broke out. It just, God got surreal in there. People started confessing sin. People started going to one another and getting things right. I remember a young woman stood up, and she said, uh, she, and we hadn't even got to any preaching yet. We just, all we'd done was sung a song and give a testimony. And I remember that young woman got up, and she said, I've got to apologize to the church. She said, I'll never forget what she said. She said, I've got to apologize to the church. She said, I've been thinking nobody loved me, and nobody cared about me. And she said, I've been wrong, and she said, I guess I just need to get over myself. She got her heart right. And before you know it, before you know it, people started coming there. The church folks getting right with each other. Preacher told me later, said, I didn't even know we was having any trouble. But they got started getting right. Families going to one another. And before it was over, all of a sudden, people started coming to get saved. And before it was done, we had seven people get saved in the service. We had some notable miracles. Those people still in the church, notable miracles. Wouldn't you like to see some notable miracles? So I looked at this notable miracle, and I thought to myself, what led up to this notable miracle? What things were going on before 
this notable miracle happen. And maybe the reason we don't see as many notable miracles as we'd like to see is we're not meeting the conditions that went on before this notable miracle took place. I know, I know it's all God. I understand that. I understand that, that God is sovereign. And I understand that God works. But I also know that God works through us and with us. And he blesses when we're obedient. He blesses obedience. So what, well, let me give you four or five thoughts here a moment, and we'll go to the house. Go back to chapter number 3 and look in verse 1. The first thing I notice here, the Bible says this, Now Peter and John. You see that in verse 1? Now Peter and John went up, look at that next word, together. Now Peter and John went up together. Now I want you to think about Peter and John a moment. You remember one day Jesus, Jesus said, whom do men say that I am? And they said, well, some say that you're uh, Elias, and some say Jeremiah, and some other prophet. And Jesus said, and whom do you say that I am? And Peter spoke up and said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And then he started about talking about building the church. And he said, upon this rock I'll build my church. Now it was not Peter the rock, because he had already called Peter Cephas, Peter a little stone that's what he called Peter it was the rock of himself that he's going to build the church on in faith in him so I'm thinking about Peter as a little stone I remember one time we were in a church service and I'm, I'm not making fun I hope you don't think I am but I, I, there was a fella up preaching we were he's preaching to us a bunch of preachers and I'm gonna tell you he was laying us low he was caught without without getting off color he was calling us every every name in the book and he was probably right we probably deserved it but I mean he was tanning our hide I always thought if you went to a preacher's meeting the, the fellow ought to get up and encourage you to live for God but man I mean he was setting us straight and we were just taking it you know and after the <laughs> He was a little short fella. Now, if you're a little short fella, don't get mad at me. But after the service, the preacher said this to me. I'll never forget it, and I, I've never heard it before. He said, uh, he said, oh, that's brother so-and-so. He's a great preacher, but, I said, but he said he suffers from little man syndrome. I said, what is little man syndrome? He said, little man syndrome is when you're, when you're little in stature and you're always trying to make up for it somehow. And, uh, and I guess he was saying that's why he was being so mean to his little man syndrome. Oh, I thought about Peter. Peter is the little stone. And he probably has the little man syndrome. You say, how do you know? Well, just look at his life. Peter's all the time boasting. Peter's all the time saying, oh, all, he said, though all forsake thee, I'll not forsake thee. It was Peter that pulled the sword out and cut off Malachus's ear. He's always trying to prove himself. So here is Peter, the little man, and then we've got John. What did Jesus call John and his brother? The sons of thunder. It was John, his brother, who said, Lord, shall we call down fire from heaven and burn this crowd up? So you've got Peter and you've got John. Don't you imagine, I, oh, I know, I know. You say, well, now they're apostles. They never, they, they were perfect. No, they were not perfect. They were human like you and I. Don't you imagine that sometime Peter would say, let's do this, and John would say, no, let's do this. Do you remember that Paul and Barnabas had a disagreement over taking John Mark on the missionary journey, and the, and the contention was so sharp that, that Paul took Barnabas and went one way, uh, and, uh, or no, he took Silas and went one way, and Barnabas took John and went another way? Of course, along the way, there would be disagreements. Of course, along the way, there'd be different point of view. We're, there were people like you and I are people. And so I can imagine there may have been times when Peter and John did not see eye to eye. When Peter and John, Peter would say, you know, I think we ought to do this. And John would say, well, I think it'd be better if we do this. Peter said, no, no, I'm sure. And John would say, no, no, I'm sure. But watch what happens here. You know what they're doing here? There is what I want to call tonight a notable partnership. Two men that are that are men who have uh, great personalities. Uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? A personality 
uh, that is set forth. There's two men that one is called the sons of thunder and one of them is called the little stone. And yet, in spite of their personalities, in spite of whatever differences they might have, the Bible said they're doing the work of God together. Now, I want to say this to you tonight. God will bless us and show us some notable miracles if we'll put our personalities aside and we'll serve the Lord together. We're to love one another and to care for one another. And the Bible said we're to be subject one to another. Here's what the Bible said. The Bible said we ought to esteem other better than ourselves. Excuse me. P uh, Paul is dealing with those two women in, the, in uh, Philippi. And he said, I beseech Yodius and Syntyche that they be of one mind. He said, here's your problem. You're, you're at odds with one another, and that's why God's not blessing. I'll tell you what we must do. We must learn to get over the difficulties we have and the disagreements we have. And we must set our eyes upon Jesus and remember that there's something more important going on here than how I feel about it. It's the gospel of Jesus. Jesus Christ and the souls of man. There is a notable partnership that takes place. You say, well, preacher, you know, I don't, I, I just, our personalities, I, can I just stop and say this? Don't, don't get mad at me. But I'm sick of this personality business. I'm sick to say, well, I'm sanguine and I'm melancholy and I'm, no, you're just a sinner saved by grace. That's what you are. People have always been different. People have always had different thoughts. People have always come from different backgrounds. People have always had different ideas. And yet, when we're in one accord like they were in that early church, the Bible said they were in one accord. They continued in the apostles' doctrine. You know what they saw? They saw notable miracles. Let's get over whatever it is that's got us crossways. Let's get over whatever it is that gets in between us serving God together. And let's, uh, let's look at that one that's lost without God. He doesn't care what you think about it. He just needs Jesus. And so there's a notable partnership. And I think if we had some notable partnerships, we'd start seeing some notable miracles. Not only is there a notable partnership, there's a notable practice here. Now Peter and John went up together in the temple at the hour, or up to the temple. Why? At the hour of prayer. Being the ninth hour. What are they going for? Apparently they're going to pray. Why else would you go to the temple at the hour of prayer unless you're going to pray? Paul said, men, or Jesus said, men ought always to pray and not to faint. Paul said, I would that men everywhere would pray everywhere, lifted up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Jesus said another place, watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. Paul said, finally, brethren, pray for us. We need to pray. We need to learn to pray. We need to pray for the power of God. We need to pray for wisdom. We need to pray for God to direct us to the places we ought to be and the people who are ready to hear. We need to pray. They went up to pray. And it'd be hard to pray if we're mad at one another. It'd be hard, be hard for me to pray with you and you to pray with me if we're at odds. But our praying is more important than our being at odds. So we need to learn to pray. We need to pray one for another. God, Samuel said this in the Old Testament. He said, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you all. We ought to pray one for another. And we ought to pray for the lost. Pray that God would soften their hearts. Pray that he would prepare the way. Pray, 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 pray. I remember, I remember we were, I was visiting a lady. I don't know how many years ago it was. It's been a long time ago. And I was, I was in Dayton, Ohio. And uh, a fellow named Dr. Lauren Dawson was preaching. And my family, the, some of you know my mother and father-in-law, Nana and Papa Pitt, and Sherry and, and myself, and I don't remember if the girls were born yet or not, but we were singing in the meeting, and Dr. Lauren Dawson was preaching. And the pastor, he said to me one day, he said, you know, we've got a lady in the church, she's 93 years old, he said, I, or 91 years old. He said, I led her to Christ three years ago, and she is bedridden. She can't come to revival. He said, you reckon we could take revival to her? I said, well, sure we can. So we went over to her house, and we went to be a blessing to her, but I'm going to tell you, she is a blessing to us. She couldn't get out of that bed, hospital bed in the room, a nurse there, a home nurse, health nurse, take care of her. And she just telling about how good it was to be saved and said three years, how good it was to know Jesus. She just testified. It was wonderful. And so we found out she loved music, and we hadn't taken any instruments. So we went back to church, got a couple guitars, and went back to her house. We sang some gospel songs. And then she said this. She said, uh, she's talking. She said, I wish you'd pray for Howard. That was her boy. I think if I remember right, he was 60-something years old. 
She said, I wish you'd pray for Howard. He's lost. He needs God. He needs to be saved. So we prayed. So Papa prayed. He got on his knees, and the preacher prayed, and she prayed in the bed, and I just laid down on the carpet with my face in the carpet, and we started calling out Howard's name to God. The lady there was there, the nurse. She was standing watching. I, I, don't, I don't think she'd ever seen anything exactly like that. And while we were praying, I heard the phone ring. She answered the phone, and I heard her say some things about, you know, yeah, that'd be fine. Okay, yeah, I, I was trying to pray, so I didn't catch it all. So when I got done praying, we were all done. She was just standing there listening to us, and she'd hung the phone up. She walked over to that lady, and she said, that was so-and-so, name some name. And she said they wanted to know if they could bring Howard over for a visit and if this would be a good time. And she said, I told her to come on. So in a little while, the door opened, four or five people come in, and here come Howard in. They just pushed him in in a wheelchair. I'd been learning this song, Beulah Land. I never had sung it, but I'd been practicing it, and Papa had heard me. So Papa said, Brian, sing that Beulah Land song. So I sang that Beulah Land song. You know that Squire Parsons song? He kind of made that famous. And I got done singing, and the preacher said, Now, I'm not going to preach, but he wasn't telling the truth. He, he pulled his chair in front of him and leaned on it like a pulpit. but he was fixing to preach and I knew he was he said I'm not going to preach but he said brother Brian was singing about Beulah Land and he said that song's about heaven and he started preaching about heaven he preached for about 10 minutes about heaven and then he said but you know heaven's not the only thing that awaits us after we die he said if we're saved we'll go to heaven but if we're lost we'll go to hell and he preached on hell for about 10 minutes in that lady's living room and then he said now would you bow your heads and close your eyes they bowed their heads. We bowed our heads, closed our eyes. Now, I know you're not supposed to peek during invitation, but we weren't in church. We were in that lady's living room, so I think the Lord will forgive me. She, he said, if you're here and, and you know if you died, you'd go to hell and you wouldn't get to go to heaven, but you'd like to go to heaven like your sins forgiven, would you raise your hand? And man, Howard's hand shot up out of that wheelchair. But I wasn't the only one peeking because Papa and the preacher, they crawled over there and laid their Bible in Howard's lap and led Howard to Christ right there in that living room. He said, Preacher, why did he tell me that? Because we just got done praying. We'd never seen him before. Didn't figure we'd ever see him in our entire life. But we prayed all together in one accord. And you know what? A notable miracle took place. God will answer our prayers if we'll pray. So we need some notable, we need some notable partnerships. We need a notable practice. And then there's a third thing. We need a notable pity. Watch what it said. A certain man lame from his mother's womb, verse 2, was carried, whom they laid daily, every day apparently, at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered in the temple, who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked in alms. Now watch verse 4. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. Let me ask you a question. Wonder how many people passed that man that day and the day before and the day before and the day before passed that man and never even thought about him. Never gave him a thought. But when Peter and John walked by and saw that man, the Bible said they fastened their eyes upon him. I thought about Lazarus lying at the gate of the rich man. The Bible said a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was the gate that laid his gate full of sore, or being full of sores and, and, and uh, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. Now, if he's desiring to be fed with the crumbs from the rich man's table, apparently he's asking someone. I wonder if it's the rich man. I wonder how many times the rich man just passed him by. He's too busy thinking about that purple and fine linen and that food on which he fared sumptuously. And he just passed by that poor beggar. But I, I look at the rich man, I say, well, he was lost. He was lost. But these people, they're going into the temple to pray. And they just pass by. But Peter and John won't pass by. They saw him. They didn't just see him. They fastened their eyes upon him. That means they looked him over. That means they stopped and couldn't go on anymore. 
That means they couldn't bring themselves to just pass by this man who was lost without God. I appreciate our sister talking about this man that she saw. You know what she did? She fastened her eyes upon him. How many people do we pass by? We have no pity. We're busy on our way. We're like the priest and the Levite that passed by on the other side of the road when the man on his way to Jericho that fell among thieves. Where is our notable pity? I remember, I remember reading about Robert Murray McShane, old Scottish preacher. He died in his 30s. He did a great work for God. At one time they said that his church was in a continuous state of revival for three years straight. And after he died, there was a young preacher who was pastoring a church and he just didn't seem like he was getting anywhere and he was so discouraged and so he thought about Robert Murray McShane. And he said, I'm going to go find where Robert Murray McShane preached and I'm going to find somebody that knew him and I'm going to find out what his secret was. So he went to McShane's church and of course McShane's already gone to be with the Lord. And he got looking around and he met a, an old man. They called him the, They called him then, I think he was the janitor, but they called him the sexton, the assistant. And he told that man, he said, I'm, I'm a young preacher. I know that Robert Murray McShane, that God did a great work here. And he said, I, I'm discouraged and I haven't seen anybody saved and I don't know what to do. So that old man said, follow me, young man. He led him down a hallway. He opened up a door. And in that door was a table and a chair. That was all that was in there. And he motioned the young man in and he pointed to the chair and he said, sit down right here. And the young man sat down. And the old man stood and looked at him. And the young man looked up expecting the old man to give him the, some kind of insight, some kind of advice, but he didn't say a word. He just looked at him. And that young man felt as though he was being mocked. And he leaned over and he put his elbows on that table. His heart broke and he buried his face in his hands and he began to weep and cry. In a little while he looked up and the old man was nodding and shaking his head, smiling. He said, yep, that's just the way McShane did it. He'd come in here and weep and cry and beg God to give him souls. That's just the way McShane did it. He had a burden. Do you have a burden? Wouldn't you like somebody to experience what you've experienced? It was a notable pity. So there's a notable partnership. There's a notable practice. There's a noble, notable pity. Then there's something else. Verse 6. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. There was a notable power. What was that power? It was the power of the name of Jesus. There's power in that name. Because he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He's the one that said all power is given to me in heaven and on earth. And so Jesus, that, that, there's power in that name. There's not power in the name Brian McBride. And there's not power in your name. And I'm a Baptist and have been and ever since I've been saved and will be till I die. But there's not power in the Baptist name. There's power in the name of Jesus. It's his name above every name. The Bible said one day every knee shall bow and every tongue shall, every knee shall bow things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There's power in that name. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. It's power. We must remember who we're going for. We're going for him. We're going because we love him. Hudson Taylor was visiting with some young men who were thinking about going to the mission field. And he said to them, why do you want to go to the mission field? One of them said, I want to go to the mission field because God command us, commands us to take the gospel to every creature. Another one said, I want to go to the mission field because men are dying without Christ and they're going to spend eternity in hell. And another one gave this reason, another one gave that reason. When they were all done, he looked at him and he said, well, he said, those are all good reasons, but none of them will keep you on the mission field. Only one thing will keep you on the mission field, and that is love for the Lord Jesus Christ. The love of Christ constraineth us. It is the power of Christ that changes a life. If we bring Christ to somebody, tell them about Jesus. There was a notable power. And then finally, there was a notable praise. 
Now this may be after the fact, but watch what it said. And leaping up, stood and walked and entered in with them in the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which happened unto him. And as the lame man which was healed beheld Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them in the porch that is called Solomon, greatly wondering. What, what got them greatly wondering? Not just they saw the difference in that man, but they heard him praising God. They were praising the Lord. God was getting the glory. I'm going to tell you, God will bless us if we make sure he gets the glory. God will move as long as he's getting the glory. If we're after the glory, God's not interested. But if God gets the glory, God will do some notable things. There ought to be some notable praise. You know what was going on a little while ago here? Notable praise. God was getting the glory. Didn't it do something for you in your heart? To hear people tell about when they got saved? Didn't it do something for you? Did something for me? Help me. It reminded me of when I got saved and what God did in my life made me want to say hallelujah, glory to God, notable praise. Yeah. Maybe one of the reasons we're not seeing notable miracles is we're not getting involved in notable praise. Right. We're not worshiping, lifting up his name. We're not telling all that he's done for us. We're not worshiping like we should be. Somebody gets saved, we say, I wonder if they meant it. Wonder if it was real. That's God's business. You praise him because God moved on somebody. God will take care of that. Amen. I told you about, I think I've already told you about the young lady. Did I tell you about the, the little children that got saved in the meeting in Georgia? I, I probably did and you don't remember. And I don't remember if I told you so we're in the same boat. Uh, preached one night and eight young people got saved. I'm talking about little children came for it. Didn't have a single adult get saved, just those children. And I know what people say, and one fellow even, he didn't come right out and say it, but kind of implied it, said, you know, they're young, wonder if they meant it. But just last spring, or maybe the spring before, I was preaching in North Carolina, and I got introduced to the preacher, and his wife was standing there, new preacher at a church up the road. She said, Brother McBride, you remember, remember that sermon down in South Georgia where eight little children got saved? I said, I sure do. She said, I was one of them. We ought to be praising God every time somebody, every time somebody responds to the gospel. I, I love seeing somebody said, boy, these little children that come to the altar, they don't, they don't know what they're doing. Maybe they don't, but maybe they do. And maybe one of these times when they come, it'll take hold. I, a friend of mine was preaching, and uh, there, was, there was two girls, two little girls, they were, they were in the service and they were talking. He saw him talking. And the fellow behind them kept tapping one on the shoulder and telling her, now be quiet, preach, preach. Shh. And they'd be quiet for a minute and then they'd start talking again. So when the invitation time come, here come both of them to the altar. And the preacher thought, they're not, they're just messing around. They've been talking through the whole service. They're just messing around. So he went down there and there were other people at the altar and altar workers were. He got down there and he said to that little girl, said, now what'd you come for? She said, she got saved. He said, you mean she wants to get saved? He said, no. She said, no, this is my friend. She got saved. He said, what do you mean she got saved? She said, back there in the pew while you were preaching. You said being saved. She said, what's that mean? And I told her and she trusted Christ. She got saved. They were coming to praise the Lord. And tell everybody about it. If we want to see some notable miracles. We're going to need, according to this passage, we're going to need some notable partnerships. We're going to have to get involved in some notable praying. We're going to need a notable pity. We're going to be notable power. And we better make sure there's some notable praise when he does move. I want you to bow your heads a moment. Many of you all of you, if you're saved, could say tonight, I used to be this, but now I'm something else. I used to live one way, but now I live a different way. That's a notable miracle. I used to love the bottle. I used to love the pill. I used to love the pleasure. But it's not that way anymore. That's a notable miracle.
I sure would like to have some more folks experience a notable miracle resurrected from the deadness of sin to the newness of life. Let's get over whatever, if we're mad about something, and I don't know that anybody is, that's not why I'm preaching, but if we are, let's get over it. Souls are hanging in the balance. Let's do something about that. God would do a notable miracle in your life if you trust Him tonight. If you'll trust Him, He'll save you tonight. If there be anybody here say, Preacher, I don't know that I'm saved, but I want to be. I wish you'd remember me when you pray. Is anybody like that tonight? You lift your hand. Nobody's looking but me, and I'll see it. I'm not saved, but I need to be, and I want to be. Anybody like that tonight? Now, Father, help us in this invitation. Lord, help us to get involved in notable things. We'd like to see some notable miracles for your honor and your glory. So you help us tonight. Speak to our hearts. Thank you for saving our souls. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. Would you please?